Welcome to First United Lutheran Church. This is the message from Sunday. It's our prayer that this message touches your heart and helps to guide you in your life. Let's listen. Psalm 77, it's on page 416 or 913 in the large print. This psalm was written by Asaph, who was a musician in, in King David's court. And I, I reading it, I kind of get the feeling that there's a little influence from King David because you can feel his Asaph's frustration and he's taking it to the Lord. He's not necessarily holding back. But it's also about how we can be comforted through hard times by remembering God's help and past issues that we've been through recalling the miracles and the works that God has done. Psalm 77, I cried out to God for help. I cried out to God to hear me. When I was in distress, I sought the Lord. At night, I stretched out untiring hands and I would not be comforted. I remembered you, God, and I groaned. I meditated, my spirit grew faint. You kept my eyes from closing. I was too troubled to speak. I thought about the former days the years of long ago. I remembered my songs in the night. My heart meditated and my spirit asked, will the Lord reject forever? Will he never show his favor again? Has his unfailing love vanished forever? Has his promise failed for all time? Has God forgotten to be merciful? Has he in his anger withheld compassion? Then I thought, to this I will appeal. The years when the Most High stretched out his right hand. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will consider all your works and meditate on your mighty deeds. Your ways, God, are holy. What God is as great as our God? You are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the peoples. With your mighty right arm, you redeemed your people, the descendants of Jacob and Joseph. The waters saw you, God. The waters saw you and withered. The very depths were convulsed. The clouds poured down water. The heavens resounded with thunder. Your arrows flashed back and forth. Your thunder was heard in a whirlwind. Your lightning lit up the world. And the earth trembled and quaked. Your path led them through the sea, your way through the mighty waters. Though your footprints were not seen, You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and of Aaron. We have a reading coming up here. Um, So because today is Mother's Day, Dean asked me to read a poem about mothers titled God Bless You Dear Mother. There are millions of mothers all over the earth. There are millions of mothers of every kind. But the one you have given to me, dear Lord, is the sweetest that's on my mind. She is tender and kind and so patient and good. Though it happens I do offend. She tells me then of the love of God and together our knees we bend. There's a secret I tell you right out of my heart. I'll whisper it soft in your ear. Won't you listen a while, then I'll share the part of the message you, you'll love to hear. I will try to obey, never grumble nor fret, try my best to be kind and to be good. Then say thank you and try and never forget all you've done, all you've done and will still do for me. God bless you, dear mother, dear mother of mine. May the glow in your eyes always shine. God meant you to be so, oh so precious to me. God bless you, dear mother of mine. Thank you, Bella. Um, I did forget one announcement, and that's uh, loose change offering. Bucket is in the back, so if you would partake in that, we would appreciate it. We continue with our, oh, special music. I'm sorry, get ahead of myself here. Worthy of every 
continue with our confessions and forgiveness. We gather in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Awesome God, nothing is hidden from you. You see us as we are. You know our desires, our weaknesses, and our failures. Send us your Holy Spirit today, and cleanse our thoughts and our hearts, so that we may come into your presence, 
with freedom to worship and exalt your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Apostle John wrote the following instructions to those who follow Jesus in 1 John 1, 8 and 9. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Please take a moment in silent reflection with God. Merciful God, we confess that we are addicted to sin and have no power to free ourselves. We have sinned against you by what we think, say, and do. We have left many good things undone. At times, we fail to love you with our whole heart, and we fail to love our neighbors as you have commanded us. Heavenly Father, as your Son, Jesus, invited his followers to do, we seek forgiveness for every transgression. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, forgive us, heal us, and lead us so that we can grow in our faith and relationship with you. Amen. In the 20th chapter of the Gospel of John, Jesus told his followers, if you forgive anyone their sins, they are forgiven. As a fellow servant of Jesus, I say to you, your sins are forgiven. In Christ, you are given the power to become the sons and daughters of God. In Jesus' name, receive the comfort and the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The first reading is from Exodus, chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when he, she could no longer hide him, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter came down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the river bank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses because I drew him out of the water. The second reading is from Hebrews chapter 11, various verses, 1 through 3, 23 through 29, 39 through 40. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commanded, commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born, because he, they saw he was no ordinary char, child, and they were not afraid of the king's edit. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated among the people of God 
rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who, well, who is invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover and application of blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land. But when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. These were all commandments for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised, since God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would we be made perfect. Here ends the lesson. Well, there's a lot of reading there. Uh, so that means I can preach for a long time, which I will not do. I promise you that. First thing I'll do is spend a little time with this cord. I think the youth group got a hold of it. They did this on purpose. <laughs> Bella did it because I made her read a poem this morning. <laughs> This is an ancient, ancient document, this Apostles' Creed. Uh, we get accused every once in a while of doing too much by tradition, and you just do everything the same way all the time. I've put a little bit of ballast to this. Uh, in the early days of the faith, obviously, Pharaoh, or not Pharaoh, but the, uh, the Caesars were into worship of themselves. So what they would do is make, uh, you know, a population of a community. Um, they'd have a festival or something. They'd have a, a bucket of uh, incense, you know, of some type. And uh, as people would walk by, they would pick one of these little pinches up and they'd put it on a fire and say, uh, Hail Pharaoh, uh, Lord of all, or something. The Christians wouldn't do that because they said, there's only one God and we're going to worship him. And, uh, and so this often led to some very, very serious consequences, like being impaled or thrown to the lions, things like that. So before there was any Gospels, there had to be some kind of teaching for people to understand really what they believed in. And so this kind of boiled out of some of that period of time so that people would know the things that they were believing in. So that's a long story for the background. If we would uh, be willing to stand to our feet as you are able and let us confess our faith in the words of this Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Uh, please, please remain standing for the reading of the gospel. Let's see if this, uh, this thing is working this morning. It is. Oh. All right. So this is a story about parenting. This is Mother's Day. And uh, this story is, is about uh, the time that Jesus got left behind by his very attentive parents. Every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover, and when he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to the custom. After the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, 
The boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. But thinking that he was in their company, they traveled on for a day, and then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they didn't find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished, and his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me, he asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they didn't understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all of these things in her heart, and Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Thus ends the reading of the gospel, and uh, you may be seated. Thank you. Everyone here who has a mother, raise your hand, or had a mother, raise your hand. I think it's pretty well unanimous. This is really something. I think I may be on to something here. (laughs) So this morning's message is directed, of course, toward our mothers and in uh, dedication to them. But I first have an announcement for tonight. May 18th, 1980, is when Mount St. Helens blew its top. Uh, Some of you remember it, some of you weren't born yet. But here's the story behind that. Before this blast, there was some terrible things going on. Uh, Seismologists were watching the activities on this thing. There was a dome in the middle of this uh, this crater up there. It It was growing by like five feet every single day, and then 10 feet, and then 15 feet. Then there were earthquakes starting to happen around there. They knew something was going on. And they sent out warning after warning after warning after warning. 57 people ignored it. They said, bah, seismologists. I've never known a seismologist to be right in my life. Anyway, they didn't know any seismologists. And it blew and 57 people died. The point is... There was a lot of warning before this happened. And so what I'm doing is making a loose analogy towards the end of times in the book of Revelation. There are some very interesting occurrences that have happened in the last 70 or 80 years that the Bible has has, uh, recorded, they um, predicted the Bible, prophecies, From the back in the time of Daniel, 3,000 years, these prophecies have been lying dormant. And a lot of that stuff is starting to really bubble to the top tonight. So my invitation is to you uh, equally to come and be challenged to understand some of the things that are going on. We'll spend a little bit of time, I think, talking about the expectations of the things that are going to happen in the Great Tribulation and the fact that 10 years ago, the stuff that happens or promised to happen in the Great Tribulation couldn't have. Couldn't have. Technology wasn't there. But today it is. And boom, boom, boom. It's just like a freight train coming down the tracks. There's so much happening. And uh, so 6.30 tonight, and there's food. All right, many of you remember this movie, very, very famous movie. Uh, So we're going to talk this morning about a very, very famous mother. Now, I have heard it said that it takes at least a master's degree, perhaps a Ph.D., to come up with an alliterated three-point sermon. See, look at that. Check that out. I came up with three words that start with D. So we're going to follow that little outline this morning. 
Before we start, let's bow in prayer for a second. Heavenly Father, thank you for our mothers. Help us to um, live our lives in respect for them as we would for you. Um, I pray this morning, in additional, in addition to that, Lord, that your Spirit would be ministering to each soul that is here this morning. Everyone here has got a burden that people may know about and they may not know about, but you do. And so I pray that would be ministered to this morning by the knowledge of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. First, the dilemma. <laughs> it's Mother's Day, and we're going to walk for a few minutes today beside Yoshebel, who is the mother of Moses, and we are going to reflect on the greatness of God through one of the greatest wonderments that God ever invented, and that is a mother's love. Yoshebel, the mother of Moses, was a Hebrew slave. She had been born into slavery. Her people had been slaves for hundreds of years. She had zero prospects of ever being liberated, being anything but a slave. Her grandmother had been a slave. Her grandkids were going to be slaves. There was no civil rights movement back in 1500 B.C., believe me. No prospect of any change in her lifetime. Every day when she got up, she was so blessed to look forward to another day of stomping around in these fields of Egyptian mud to make bricks all day long in that blistering tropical sun. But before she even got to go out and start that enjoyable day in the muck and the straw, she had to get her other kids going. She had two of them, Miriam and Aaron. They were both older than Moses. She was a brick maker. Yoshebel was involved in the world of making bricks. She might have cut the straw, she might have stamped in the mud, she might have been carrying the water, but whatever a task a slave is given, it's still a slave's task. So every day, Yoshebel woke up to hardship, to drudgery, and a never ending river of bad news. Then one day the Israelite slaves heard some really bad news. A decree came down from Pharaoh on high that all the new male children in the land were going to be tossed into the Nile River because there was too many of these Hebrew pests infesting the land. Any newborn male would be thrown into the river to be eaten up by those 18-foot crocodiles. That was terrible news, but for Yoshebel... There was a much worse news to come. She found out she was pregnant. Pregnant! And these Egyptian soldiers were prowling around on the streets everywhere, night and day, waiting to hear the cry of an infant. And when they did hear the cry of an infant, those brutes would break down the door. They'd barge in with spears bristling, swords flashing to get that baby. And you know, I don't think they distinguished sometimes too much between a girl child and a boy child. When they found a Hebrew baby, it was time to get it to the river. So, Yoshebel had a dilemma. Uh, by the way, let's bring Yoshebel forward. Let's fast forward the clock in time to America in 2021 A.D. What kind of thoughts would be going through her mind? She might be thinking if she lived here in America and she read all the fashionable modern family magazines that if her child was going to be born into slavery, born into poverty, born into a destiny of hard life, why would a mother even carry her child to term? This is a pretty clear-cut case. It would clearly be wrong to bring a child into a world like that. 
problematic, you see. That's a, that's a word that we have floating around in our society. A child like that would be problematic. Well, you know, those arguments may fill the classrooms of our universities. Yoshebel would have had to stand against those arguments because what possibly could be worse than to bring a child into guaranteed poverty and slavery? How could a mother inflict her slavery on a new baby? It's wrong. But, you see, her mind was filled with higher thoughts. She didn't think that way then. She wouldn't think that way today. No, her thoughts were born of God, not of Margaret Sanger. But back to making bricks. She was a slave, but her masters could never put chains on her thoughts. They couldn't chain her spirit. They could never lay a whip on her faith. Those are gifts from Almighty God. So you can bet she had plenty of sleepless nights. She was worried about what would become of her unborn child, but somewhere in those sleepless midnight hours, as she prayed to God, asking Him what to do, God brought some peace into her life. Everything in the hands of God would be all right. Uh, because, you see, there was a little history of slavery already in the children of Israel. Remember, uh, she knew this story of Joseph, who had spent 10 years in an Egyptian prison as a slave, and yet rose to be the second highest command in Egypt. She knew that. She knew that. So, yes, she did have a dilemma, but she had some peace. She put everything into God's hands, even the life of her unborn child. But her trials were not over yet because even though she had some peace, there was a delay. Finally, the time came for her child to be delivered. Can you imagine how she felt that night in the terrifying blackness of that night when the cry of a single child would pierce through that Darkness, like a foghorn, her baby Moses was born under the very shadow of an Egyptian sword. But don't you know that those angels were kept very busy that night, plugging the ears of those Egyptian soldiers, those murderous brutes? They didn't hear a thing. God, here's the thing, God has his purpose, God works his purpose, and God's purpose will not be turned aside for any king, for any soldier, for any spear, for any sword, for any president. I can see those angels stuffing their fingers into the ears of those Egyptian soldiers and having a good laugh while they were doing it. So Moses was born, and that first terrifying night passed without Egyptian spears pounding on the door. Then a second night passed. And then a third. And then a month passed, and then two, and then three. It is not easy sometimes to wait for the timing of God, is it? In Yoshebel's situation, time was definitely not on her side because babies are babies, and even though Moses might have been a quiet and a peaceful baby, um, a baby is going to cry. And can you imagine the panic that would go over her spirit every time that, uh, that Moses cried? She, and and it, it can be impossible sometimes to wait. A day passes. If we're in pain, a day passes. Interminable time. Slowly it passes. Three months she went like this. And she probably heard stories from other mothers. She wasn't the only mother with a baby in that time. Those children were torn from the arms of their mothers and thrown into the Nile. And that could not have been very reassuring news. But she knew, she knew that the day of Moses' birth and the day of Moses' death 
as all of our days of birth and death are recorded in God's books. She still had her peace. She still had peace. So after three months of agonizing every night, and lying awake, sleepless, she finally got a word from God what to do. It was the plan of deliverance. Check that out. There's a third word that starts with D. This is really something. I should ask for a raise. <laughs> no, I will not. Okay, here's the plan. This is the one that came to her in the dead of the night. Here you go. Weave a basket, paint the bottom with some tar, put the baby in it, set it out afloat on the Nile River and see what happens. Nothing to it. Well, God blessed the faith of a mother. God gave her that vision, and that's what she did. I can imagine that, even though she had kids, she still had to work, put bricks together, or chop straw, or do something. So while she's out working during the day, she's putting this idea together, how am I going to do this? This is what I have to do. So I'm, I'm guessing, it doesn't record that, but I'm guessing this is one way it could have played out. When she got home, she started to get the materials to weave a basket. Now, the Bible calls it an ark. Only two other pla- one other place it talks about an ark. It's, the word is tebot. One's for Noah. One is for Moses. So an ark can be big and it can be small. It's just a vessel that floats on the water, as far as the word uh, officially means. But if she's going to make that basket herself, she's going to make it out of the best stuff. So she, after work, she got done. She went home, got wading along the river and picking the very, 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 very best reeds that she could find. And she wove this thing together. It took a few days to finish. But she finally did. And there it was. The most faithful, wicker basket that was ever woven in the history of the world. And finally, this moment, the morning of destiny, arrived. This was the morning to take her child, put him in the hands of God. She kissed her little baby goodbye, laid him in the ark, floated him out on the water and into the hands of God. Now, once again, the angels had a bunch of work to do. They had to lock the jaws of a bunch of these 18-foot crocodiles that were laying around there. They had to arrange for Pharaoh's sister to be down by the river at just the right time. And I want to point out another great truth. In the pursuit of protecting God's purpose, the angels never miss. Never. If God has a purpose and the angels are down there to protect it, that purpose is going to be accomplished no matter what kind of odds are against it. So here's Moses. He floated out on the river. The angels locked up the jaws of the crocodiles. The angels brought the princes down to the water at just the right time. The princes opened the basket and there was the baby she had been praying for. And don't you know, I think just then, an angel reached down there and pinched Moses so he'd cry. That's what the Bible says. The prince's heart melted. This crying baby, somebody had pinched him. (laughs) What could she do? But, I mean, it just triggered all the motherly instincts. And she took this baby, and, uh, and here comes Miriam. I see you found a baby. Would you like me to go find a a Hebrew to take care of it and nurse this baby for you? And Miriam or uh, and the the Pharaoh's sister said, "Of course, yes." Think about this. What a joke! What a great joke! The treasury of that same wicked, nasty, evil, mean Pharaoh, who had decreed that all Hebrew babies were going to be killed is now generously paying a Hebrew mother to raise her own Hebrew son. Don't tell me God doesn't have a sense of humor. 
so beautiful. And this was something that I don't think Moses' mom could have even predicted, something this perfect. So when God wanted to raise up a hero that had enough sand to stand up to a tyrant and to liberate a nation, did he send Moses to live under the tutelage of an army general? Nope. He picked a mother. When God wanted to raise up a mind that was strong enough to stand up against the wily demons behind Egyptian idol worship, did he send Moses to live under the mentorship of a Greek philosopher? Nope. He chose a mother. When God wanted to raise up a hero that was great enough to write the law for the entire human race for the entirety of its existence, that even today is the basis for all natural law in every nation on earth, and then to be the instrument of the supernatural events as inconceivable as the parting of the Red Sea, producing water from solid rock, daily manna bread from heaven for 40 years, and yet be recognized as the most humble man on earth, did he send him to grow up under the teachings and the wing of Karl Marx? Vladimir Lenin? Nope. God chose a mother because Moses was homeschooled. He was homeschooled long before he went to these highbrow Egyptian universities. You see, God had first dibs on Moses' mind. He wanted that child raised right. And so from his earliest times, his earliest days, Moses sat under the teaching of the love of a mother. From her, Moses learned the ways of God. Moses was not perfect. He might have gotten messed up for a while. But when he was old, he did not depart from the teachings of his mom and of God. The roots of a mother's teaching run very, very deep. They run deep enough so that when God came looking 40 years later for the right person, actually 80 years later, Moses was 80 years old when he was called. So if we think that we're too advanced in years and too seasoned to be used in God's purpose, uh, we, we, we need to rethink that. We need to rethink that. I think, if not for Yoshebel, there would have never been a Moses. She probably never saw his redemption, you know. He had a really rough period there. He was convicted of murder, and he was banished from Egypt, exiled. Yoshebel probably saw that because he was 40 years old. But it was another 40 years before Moses got back. So maybe the last thing that Yoshebel ever saw was Moses disappearing into the desert as a murderer. And she probably thought, this is hopeless. There's no hope. She might have been tempted to think that. Maybe, maybe God allowed her to live long enough to see Moses return. But sometimes we as parents... Or as people, we die before we see our prayers answered. That might have been the case for Yoshebel. But I'll say this. Yoshebel, she's here with us today. She's sitting here, and she's sitting here, there, there. In fact, everyone in this room has been called to be a Yoshebel. Everyone has been called to influence their world for Christ. Listen to this, 2 Timothy 4. Preach the word, be ready, in season, out of season, correct and rebuke and exhort with great patience and instruction. Use self-restraint in all things and endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. What? What, do we think that those words are only for Timothy? No, of course not. They're for all Christ's disciples. And I tell you this, Timothy and Paul, Peter, they would have rejoiced 
to live in a time as wicked and twisted and perverted as ours because what a field of harvest we have everywhere around us. I don't need to go very far. I will close with some words of encouragement. We are at the same time that thing which we are and that thing which we are called to become. When God called Abraham, he called him twice. Abraham, Abraham. But in the Greek, or sorry, in the Hebrew, there is a slash between those two words. It's called a disjunctive, and it is like they are two distinct, different people. Same thing happened for Samuel. When he came and called Samuel, Samuel, we could say, he's, he, we could translate that as, the two persons, to the two persons who are living in Abraham, God called Abraham to himself, both as the Abraham that he was at that moment and the Abraham that he was going to become. And so we are the same this morning. We are both the mother that we are, and we are the mother that God wants us to become. We are at the same time the father that we are and the father that God wants us to become. We are at the same time the witness that we are and the witness that God wants us to become. What a promise. All of those great heroes in the Bible fell on their face many times, just as we have fallen on our face, and probably will. But the mercy of God, think of all of the things that God accomplished through an exiled murderer by the name of Moses. He's got room for us, too. How do we get there? Well, I do this every Sunday. Use this, study it, make it a part of your life. If I had my cell phone, I'd haul that up and say, use this, throw this away. As far as the teachings that guide your life, decisions, everything you need is right here. And it hasn't changed. And the sins, by the way, that we see welling up all around us, the ones that come in as a tidal wave in America and through the television and the movies, there's not a thing new about any of them. Nothing. Satan's armies are very active, but they're not very original. It's the same junk being thrown at us that was thrown at Abraham, that was thrown at Peter. Be of good cheer. Christ has overcome the world. The dilemma... Ooh, I forgot. Oh, you guys carried the day... You put my third word up there. Wow. Well, somebody did. <laughs> the dilemma, the delay, and the deliverance. It isn't us fighting the battle. It's, it's Almighty God. Let us close with prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you once again for everyone. Everyone who is at this moment considering in their spirit before you, how they might lay a little bit more area of our lives before you, give you command over it. Pray that you'd be with us through the uh, upcoming week. Pray that your presence would be with the Bible study tonight. Uh, and we ask all of this in the name of Jesus, for his sake. Amen. Let us stand and pray together the Lord's Prayer, and then we will close with a hymn. I'll just say, uh, let's see, what do we got here? Happy is the house where God, when God is there. Uh, the words will be up on the screen. Let's pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
Before the benediction, uh, I'd like to once again thank Bella for being really good sport and reading some hackneyed poetry from the 1950s. Let's give her a hand. <laughs> but it's very sincere, and it's a very nice little poem, actually. Um, once again, a reminder for tonight, uh, come and learn about the bullet that is headed right for our chest. Now, receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you his peace. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks be to God. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. <laughs> Thank you for listening to this message from First United Lutheran Church.